Hi there, Rachel Chase here, and in this video we're going to explore indirect proofs using proof by contradiction, and in the next video we'll explore proof by contrapositive. So what does it mean to use a proof by contradiction, and why is this called an indirect argument? What makes this different than direct proof technique is that you have to essentially alter the form of what it is you're trying to show in order to come to some type of conclusion. Now, a proof by contradiction, in a way, is kind of fun because you're using a fact, the fact being that there's only two things that could ever happen. Uh, for example, if you're proving things about even or odd, um, you could use a proof by contradiction depending on the context of the problem. So using proof by contradiction, you basically are telling the audience, let's assume the opposite is true. If there's only two things that can happen and you can somehow show that things break down when you assume the opposite, it's actually allowing you to justify why the original statement must be true to begin with. So let's take a look at an example here. Prove that there is no integer which is both even and odd. What makes this a good candidate for proof by contradiction? Well, the fact of the matter is how do you show that no integer has a property, right? So that's an infinitely large set of values. Instead, if it can have a property where it's both even or odd, that's the direct opposite of saying that it can never happen. So think of it again as what makes it a good candidate when there's only two possibilities, this being one of those. So to prove this, let's make a statement. Let's assume that x is an integer such that it is both even and odd. So we're making that statement that it has these same properties. Remember, we know it's false. You've verified this. You've thought about this before you ever make that statement. Now, if we can show that when we make this assumption, things break down, that's what we're working towards in a proof like this. What else do we know? By the definition of even, x can be written as 2k for some integer k. We also know by the definition of odd that x can be written as 2m plus 1 for some integer m. Remember, just, you know, pro tip, right? You can never reuse variables here, okay? Now, after we've made those expansions, we know that we can substitute in. By substitution, x is in fact equal to itself. So if x is equal to itself, that means that 2k is equal to 2m plus 1. There's nothing wrong with us saying that. We're going to make a little bit of a rearrangement here, right? So if we have, uh, let's see, 2k is equal to 2m plus 1, and you divide both sides by 2, let's get k by itself. Remember, k is an integer. We get k is equal to m plus one half. Now, there's something very, it should be very obvious here, maybe not when you first practice, but as you go through things, you have to find out what makes this uncomfortable, what's awkward about this, what doesn't feel like it should be right. Well, remember, x is an integer. We define k and m as integers. If x, k, and m are all integers, and you just said k is equal to an integer plus one half, one half being a rational number. We've seen in other videos that an integer plus a rational number is not going to be an integer. So what's problematic about this? Well, it may not be a rational. One half is not going to make this an integer value. So what's problematic about this? We defined up here for k to be an integer, but down here, k is actually a rational number. So if we made that assumption, we're going on the fact that k is a rational number, not an integer. That's our contradiction. And it may not feel obvious. It takes definitely a lot of practice to start to see these things and get used to them. But now it's something that we can be aware of. 
So if you find a contradiction, sometimes you'll see the lightning bolt symbol used just to say, hey, look, there is a contradiction here. From there, you have to still explain and justify. So everything that we just said that we talked about still has to be justified. So what have we stated? We have shown that in fact, k is not an integer, but instead a rational number. This is a contradiction to our definition of even. Therefore, our original assumption must have been false. Thus, there is no integer that is both even and odd. And just like we've done with our other proofs, you can write QED at the end or you're closed in box. And while this proof may feel like it was very quick to work through, sometimes it takes a little bit of manipulation to find the contradiction. Again, it's not necessarily going to jump out at you very quickly, but these are the types of things you should be looking for. When you're searching for a contradiction, it's statements that you make about things being integers, things being rational, things being even, odd, whatever the case may be, and it's all about how you choose to manipulate it that's going to make the contradiction fall out of it. Again, it takes some practice, but the more you practice, the more comfortable that you will become with things like this. Another kind of cool thing that you can prove using a proof by contradiction is actually why the square root of 2 is irrational. So we know the square root of 2 is irrational, but how do you prove that that happens? We prove it using a contradiction proof because if something is not irrational, then what's the opposite of that? It would be rational. So if you cannot show that it's rational, then in fact it is irrational. So to prove this, Again, start your proof out like any other with the word proof and make the assumption, assume that the square root of 2 is a rational number. Remember, if you're stating this, this is your hypothesis, you believe it to be rational, that gives you a lot to work with. We know the definition of rational and that means we can write it as a fraction basically. So by the definition of rational, that means that since it's rational, the square root of 2 is equal to, I don't know, p over q, pick your favorite variables, where p is an integer and q is a non-zero integer. Now, what else do we know? Okay, well, this is an equation now. Manipulate it. If you take the square root of 2 equal to p over q, and you square both sides, we get that 2 is equal to p squared over q squared. Just trying to organize things a little bit here. So what else do we know here? That 2q squared is equal to p squared divide both sides by 2, q squared is equal to p squared over 2. And this is where things should start to get uncomfortable. q is an integer, non-zero specifically. If q is an integer, that means q squared has to be an integer because of the closure property of the integers under multiplication. So if q is an integer, but you can write it as p squared over 2, there's no guarantee that that will also, in fact, be an integer. So we have found our contradiction. Just like we did in the previous proof, take a moment and you're going to write out all of that justification that we just explained. So since q is an integer, q squared is also an integer by the closure property of the integers under multiplication. However, what did we learn here? We've shown that q squared 
equals p squared over 2 is not an integer because this piece right here is not an integer. This is our contradiction. Make sure you wrap everything up. Therefore, our original assumption was false. Thus, we have shown that the square root of 2 is rational, is irrational. Now, as far as notation and things like that go, when you're writing out sentences and whatnot, you don't have to get as formal as this. You could use mostly this type of notation, right, with the symbols and such. There's really no hard rules about it. Some people prefer writing out everything, uh, which we, we learn about in the introduction to discrete math. You can write out, right, Q squared, write out the word. It doesn't necessarily have to be symbolic. Uh, the choice is up to you, but as you can see, some algebra is required still for this proof. Um, just make sure, again, that one of the most important parts is that you wrap up the rest of that proof by explaining and justifying where the contradiction is and how that worked out. Thanks for watching.